In the West, philosophers write long non-fiction books, often using incomprehensible words, and limit their involvement with the world to lectures and committee meetings. But in the East, especially in the Zen tradition, philosophers write poems, rake gravel, go on pilgrimages, practice archery, write aphorisms on scrolls, chant, and in the case of one of the very greatest Zen thinkers, Sen no Rikyu, involve themselves in teaching people how to drink tea in consoling and therapeutic ways. Sen no Rikyu was born in 1522 in the wealthy seaport of Sakai near the present-day Osaka. His father was a warehouse owner who worked in the fish trade and wished his son to join him in business. But Rikyu turned away from commercial life and went in search of wisdom and self-understanding instead. He became fascinated by Zen Buddhism, apprenticed himself to a few masters, and took to a life of wandering the countryside with few possessions. Zen Buddhism was founded by travelling monks who believed that people best could find spiritual meaning not by thinking complex thoughts or performing great deeds, but by doing often very simple things with intense thoughtfulness and concentration. The wise Bodhidharma, for example, is believed to have stared at a wall for nine years to improve his focus. Rikyu chose to focus on something that was a little more refreshing than staring at the wall, drinking tea. Today we remember him for the contributions he made to the reform and appreciation of the Chanoyu, the Japanese tea ceremony. It literally means hot water for tea. The Japanese have been drinking tea since the 9th century, the practice having been imported from China by merchants and monks. The drink was considered healthy as well as calming and spiritual, but it was Rikyu's achievement to put the tea ceremony on a more rigorous and profound philosophical footing. The Japan of his era had grown image conscious and money focused. Rikyu promoted an alternative set of values which he termed wabi-sabi, a compound word combining wabi or satisfaction with simplicity and austerity with sabi, an appreciation of the imperfect. Across fields ranging from architecture to interior design, philosophy to literature, Rikyu awakened in the Japanese a taste for the pared down and the authentic, for the undecorated and the humble. His particular focus was the tea ceremony, which Rikyu believed to hold a superlative potential to promote wabi-sabi. He made a number of changes to the rituals and aesthetics of the ceremony. He began by revolutionising the space in which the tea ceremony was held. It had grown common for wealthy people to build extremely elaborate tea houses in prominent public places, where they served as venues for worldly gatherings and displays of status. Rikyu now argued that the tea house should be shrunk to a mere two metres square, that it should be tucked away in secluded gardens, and that its door should be made deliberately a little too small, so that all who came into it, even the mightiest, would have to bow and feel equal to others. The idea was to create a barrier between the tea house and the world outside. The very path to the tea house was to pass around trees and stones to create a meander that would help break ties with the ordinary realm. Properly performed, a tea ceremony was meant to promote what Rikyu termed wa, harmony, which would emerge as participants rediscovered their connections to nature, in their garden hut, smelling of unvarnished wood, moss and tea leaves. They would then be able to feel the wind and hear the birds outside, and feel at one with a non-human sphere. They might come to an emotion known as k, respect, the fruit of sitting in a confined space with others and being able to converse with them free of the pressures and artifice of the social world. A successful ceremony was to leave its participants with a feeling of jaku, tranquility, and sei, purity, central concepts in Rikyu's gentle, calming philosophy. Rikyu's prescriptions for the ceremony extended to the instruments employed. He argued that tea ceremonies shouldn't rely on expensive or conventionally beautiful cups or teapots. He liked worn bamboo tea scoops that made a virtue of their age, and bamboo flower vases like this one which he carved himself. Because in Zen philosophy everything is impermanent, imperfect and incomplete, Objects that are themselves marked by time and haphazard marks can, Rikyu suggested, embody a distinct wisdom and promote it in their users. It's one of Rikyu's achievements to take an act which in the West is one of the most routine and unremarkable activities and imbue it with a solemnity and depth of meaning akin to a Catholic mass. Every aspect of the tea ceremony, from the patient boiling of the water to the measuring out of green tea powder, was coherently related to Zen's philosophical tenets about the importance of humility, the need to sympathise with and respect nature, and the sense of the importance of the transient nature of existence. It's open-ended where this approach to everyday life may go. It leaves open the possibility that many actions and daily habits might, with sufficient creative imagination, become similarly elevated, important and rewarding in our lives. The point isn't so much that we should take part in tea ceremonies, rather that we should make aspects of our everyday spiritual lives more tangible by allying certain material and sensual rituals. Rikyu reminds us that there is latent sympathy between big ideas about life and the little everyday things like certain drinks, cups, implements and smells. 
These things are not cut off from the big themes. They can make those themes more alive for us. It's the task of philosophy not just to formulate ideas, but also to work out mechanisms by which these ideas may stick more firmly and viscerally in our minds.